I'm back up because I have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today, a gentleman who has traveled from Canada to be with us. And this is going to be a fantastic presentation, one I have been eagerly awaiting personally. So let me um, tell you a little bit about Daryl, but his full bio biography as well as the other speakers and panelists today are in the program. Daryl Rowledge is an Alberta businessman and public policy analyst who has spent over 25 years researching, writing, and speaking on a variety of public policy issues. An avid outdoorsman, hunter, and conservationist, Daryl is internationally known for his research and advocacy on issues related to domestication and disease. In addition to many articles and op-eds, Daryl is the author of No Accident, Public Policy and Chronic Wasting Disease in Canada. The recipient of numerous awards, Daryl has a long record of conservation work, including testimony to numerous legislators, departments of wildlife and natural resources, and before the Standing Committee on the Environment in the House of Commons. Daryl is currently working to adapt his 2008 book, No Accident, for, as a feature-length feature do documentary film, part of a collaborative effort to bring together scientists, conservation organizations, economists, industry, and the general public to secure comprehensive science-based public policy. Please welcome Daryl Rollage. I want to thank the organizers for the generous invitation to come here. Um, this is only my second trip to Wisconsin, but I need to tell you that a lot of my heroes are here. People who are just absolutely brilliant in a variety of different fields, and they've been so incredibly generous over a long time and countless hours, <laughs> and you could ask them about that, of discussion of issues in deep science, in economics, in law, in public policy, and in particular, how those things uh, play into what I think is one of the greatest mysteries of our time. And this isn't a mystery at the deep end of a silo of science and quantum physics or something, although those are interesting. This is right on the surface. This is right in front of all of us. And the mystery is how it is that the greatest threats that we face very often hide in plain sight. They're right in front of us, and we don't see them. And it happens over and over and over again. The science is there. And it's not just the science. This is the information age. We can put a supercomputer in your pocket. We're constantly connected to the world of information. And yet, huge problems sneak up and bite us in the ass. And it happens over and over and over again. It doesn't matter whether it's international conflicts or diseases. or it's a, It happens over and over again. And I want to get one thing out of the way right away. And because some people have suggested that, well, yeah, but if money was involved, then this wouldn't happen. Nuh-uh. <laughs> In 2007 and 8, we faced complete global financial meltdown, despite the fact that the experts, the journalists, the business journalists that scan the horizon every single day looking for anything, they completely missed it. But in retrospect, none of it was an accident. Hence the title of this. So the final thing that goes into this is that this happens despite some really important people doing their best to try to warn us. So this is Bill Gates, one of the most successful people in history, the richest guy on the planet. And uh, he's retired from Microsoft now, so this is his new day job. He was at the TED conference in Vancouver, British Columbia. And he actually wheeled this barrel out on stage as a prop. He, um, he was warning that when he was a kid, the greatest threat to the planet was from missiles. And so if the worst happened, nuclear war, then he and his family were supposed to go down into the basement and eat out of that barrel. Now, oddly enough, Bill Gates was not there to talk about how absurd that was. He was there to explain that the great threats today are not from missiles, they're probably from microbes, from infectious diseases. Now, Bill Gates is absolutely right about this. He misses some really important stuff that hide in plain sight right under his nose, but he's absolutely right about this. But there's something that's unfortunate. 
begins with the fact that not a lot of people paid attention. The TED audience is pretty enlightened, but even there, they were a lot more interested in this presentation. This woman was there to talk about the fallout of a sexual affair that she had 20 years ago. It got three times the number of watches as Bill Gates did. And as far as the mainstream media was concerned, they completely ignored Bill Gates, but they were all over the Monica Lewinsky story, and they neglected to get across her vital message about the, the problem of shaming. They just went for the sex and the politics. This is a problem. People don't look deeply enough. We're distracted. Now, admittedly, we're biologically programmed to pay attention to sex, and it drives everything. Here's a, another example. This is the swimsuit issue of Sports Illustrated magazine. It is a billion dollar industry because it's clickbait. It generates hits. People look at it. But this isn't the edition that I'm interested in. It's this one. The Super Bowl edition that comes out just before the Super Bowl. Because like the swimsuit issue, exposure drives sales and the Super Bowl is the biggest commercial event in history. When it's on, 100 million people are watching it and the ads have become an industry unto themselves. So why is this relevant to a wildlife group? Well, if you look at the cover story, if we can zoom in a little bit, Ray Lewis of the Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens, headed into the Super Bowl, was accused of using a weird performance-enhancing drug, Velvet Antler Spray. Now, this went absolutely berserk. It was not just Ray Lewis, it was not just football players, it was baseball, it was hockey, it was basketball, professional golfer Vijay Singh. This went crazy. And what was weird about it is that it was so bizarre you couldn't tell the difference between the anchors and the journalists that were discussing this and the late night comedians. So this is just one example. And sadly, folks, the game itself is being marred by accusations about one of the star players. Baltimore Ravens linebacker Ray Lewis is denying a Sports Illustrated report that claims that he used a banned substance while recovering a torn triceps this season. The article claims Lewis was given deer antler spray to speed up his recovery. It comes from what they call the velvet of deer antlers. Deer antler spray? Yes. Deer antler spray. Which, of course, was banned after Lance Armstrong became the first hooved winner of the tour. Evidently, evidently, I did not know this, but deer antlers contain a hormone called IGF-1 that is thought to help muscle recovery. <laughs> Personally, I think all the players should take this stuff. The NFL has a real head injury problem, and antlers are nature's helmets. In fact, you know what? All football teams should be permitted to take performance-enhancing drugs as long as they are extracted from their team's mascot. <laughs> I say let the Chicago players inject bear bile. Let Cincinnati snort tiger dong. And the Washington, whoa. <laughs> full disclosure, folks. Full disclosure, and it's important to me. This issue is personal for me. Because I, too, have been accused by my rivals of abusing deer antler spray. I guess they wonder how I can keep this up night after night without ever... So while, while Steve, Stephen Colbert was chewing his cud and the mainstream media was going absolutely berserk about this, all the late night comedians, Letterman, all of them, they missed the real story. It was hiding in plain sight right in front of them. Now I keep saying that, so what exactly was hiding in plain sight? Well, begin with the fact that there's not a shred of evidence to indicate that this stuff actually works, but there is volumes. There are volumes of, of scientific information indicating that there are disease problems with this. IGF-1 is a known carcinogen in high volumes that they say they're selling. And chronic wasting disease can, the University of Kentucky proved that it can be spread through velvet antler. And spray is a very efficient means of moving it. So while they missed the real story, the lawyers did their work and 
the World Anti-Doping Agency, they threw in the towel. They delisted it, it's now legal. This is ridiculous. What's behind that, though, is that they didn't bother to look at the industry that was producing it. It is profoundly anti-conservation, and when you look at the treatment of animals, it's absolutely obscene. The whole thing is ridiculous, but nobody paid attention. It was right there hiding in plain sight because the Western world has a problem of perspective. We don't see the coming tragedy. Now, interestingly, Garrett Hardin famously described the tragedy of the commons, where common resources like wildlife can be depleted before our very eyes, and we don't realize it's going on. The cod fishery off the coast is an example of that. And he uses an economic model to show why this happens. But there's a problem. It happens just as profoundly on private land as it does in common, in, pu in public wildlife. So what's really going on? I call it micro-market myopia. If we have a narrow view, if we measure well-being in, in the marketplace in money, and we do it only over the short term, our vision is impaired. It's, a, it's a, an impaired vision. We don't see what's coming, and it sneaks up, and it bites us in the ass. Now, is there a way around this? Of course, comprehensive analysis. We, we can't look just narrowly. We have to look at the broad view. We have to understand that not only are the environment and the economy mixed and interrelated, one is a complete subset of the other. There are no economies absent life. And then finally, we have to understand that we have to look to the long term as well as the short term. And when we do that, when we do what people here have been advocating already, when we have science and evidence-based analysis, it's a huge benefit. We see tragedy coming, and we identify opportunities for gain. So this turns out to be a great asset to the public. And it turns out that it's no different than a whole bunch of other public assets that we have, public systems assets. When President Eisenhower put the interstate highway system in, it turned out to generate volumes more benefit than the cost of building it and maintaining it. That's a public systems asset. Education, providing a, an educated workforce, is a public systems asset. The same with healthcare, having a healthy workforce. One of my favorites, though, is wildlife as public trust. And unfortunately, this is one of those that not a lot of people know about. I call it the greatest story never told. So I'd like to go back in history a bit and talk about how we got here. So think back a couple hundred years. Thomas Jefferson, 1801, he's elected president of the United States. And shortly thereafter, he sends Lewis and Clark out on their great expedition to document the geography, the people, and the resources of the continent. Now, if you read their journals, they ran out of words to describe the wildlife that they saw. It was so phenomenal, it was unbelievable. Okay, well fast forward a hundred years. Vice President Teddy Roosevelt is hunting in the Adirondacks. President McKinley is assassinated. The Washington Press Corps, they weren't amused by this. They said, oh, that damn cowboy is now president. Well, it's rather bizarre because Teddy Roosevelt is, is revered as the conservation president. So what's that about? Well. All of that wildlife, not a little bit, all of it was at the brink of extinction. 16 million bison gone, 40 million antelope gone, dozens of millions of deer, songbirds, shorebirds, migratory birds, they were all at the brink of extinction across North America. So President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Laurier in Canada brought their best people together repeatedly to try to figure out how to deal with this crisis. Now the first thing they had to do is figure out what the hell happened? It didn't take them long to answer that question. This is a wagon load of elk going to market. Here are just a few bison skulls going to market. These are just a few feathers going to market. That lower left photo is there, it contains a thousand hummingbird skins going to market. So what they realized it wasn't rocket surgery. If you put a price on the head that some, of something that's dead, that's what you're going to get. So they brought their best people together and they passed a series of laws out of utter desperation to deal with this issue. And much later, at the University of Calgary, Val Geist, a professor there, managed to figure out how these 
these laws that had become universal by 1921 actually worked together as a model. He called it the North American model of wildlife conservation, and it has seven principles. The first was declared by the United States Supreme Court in the early 1800s. It's wildlife as a public resource. In Martin V. Waddell, the court established and then reaffirmed after that wildlife belongs to the public, not even to a landowner. They knew that they had to take the price off its head, so they prohibited marketing in wildlife. They said, you know, if we ever get it back, we're going to allocate it by law, not by who owns the land. They knew that because this belonged to everyone, it was going to be democratic, so there should be opportunity for all. They said that there would be killing only for legitimate cause, for food, for wildlife management, or for predator control, but not for sale. They also knew that wildlife is an international resource, so they had to have treaties in place. And finally, they knew that they wanted to have science at the base of pu public policy. This is what they did. That's sometimes called the Roosevelt Doctrine. Now, the result, absolutely amazing. They established a public systems asset based in wildlife. It is the greatest environmental success story in the history of the planet. And when we got wildlife back, because we replenished the whole continent by taking the price off its head, it turned out that we stumbled into the golden goose. Because all these industries grew up around the enjoyment of wildlife, both consumptively and not. It's phenomenal. Making and selling a mountain of outdoor equipment, providing the services, uh, both consumptive and not. I want to give you one statistic as to how big this is. This is from Canada, from Canada's National Wildlife Disease Strategy. The data are a little bit old now, but in 1996, the activities of hunting, fishing, and wildlife associated recreation generated $12.1 billion to Canada's GDP in that year. And then they went on to use government data to show that that was almost identical to the $12.3 billion that was the total contribution to GDP in the same year from all of agriculture. The data are the same in the United States. But there are two more things in this that we, benefits that we get, I don't even know how you put a price tag on. The first is that if you're going to protect wildlife, you have to protect the wild places. So you have to protect habitat and biodiversity. Now, I don't know how you put a price tag on that. And the second had to do with the health of the wildlife. Maintaining biodiversity keeps wildlife healthy, but it turns out that this is uh, as important for us as it is for wildlife because of this factor. Most of the infectious diseases we suffer come to us from animals. But there's a mystery here, and it has two parts. First, it's really hard to get a disease to jump a species barrier. And second, it's even harder to get one that will jump a species barrier and then be contagious in that new species. So if these two things are true, and they are, then how do we explain that most of our diseases come from animals? It's because of this. It's because of pathogenesis, the creation of new and more virulent pathogens, and it's a, it's a consequence of domestication. And I want to take you through some of the factors underlying this. We don't have a huge amount of time, so I want to go fairly quickly. But the first one, everyone knows instinctively. What happens when you catch a wild animal? It's terrified. OK, so what does that mean biologically? Its heart is racing. Its blood pressure is sky high. Its respirations are high. It's doing all sorts of cool biological things. It's sending blood to the large muscle masses, getting it ready to fight or flee for its life. Very cool. But the endocrine system that does that is also responsible for our immune system, for our adaptive immune system. So stress compromises our immune system. Keeping animals long-term in captivity compromises their immune system. And then a whole bunch of other things come into play. First, we have high densities of animals. This is like taking your kid to daycare. If one has an infectious disease, it's going to move around. We have to feed these animals large portions of the year, so we have to store grasses and grains, which attracts all kinds of rodents and all of their diseases and their parasites and insects, vectors, and they live in squalor. This is a biological soup. And then biology starts to select, and two things happen. First of all, the ones that are susceptible die off, but then we select for what we want. 
in agriculture. We want eggs, we want wool, we want meat. We don't want wild animals trying to kill us. We don't want them trying to escape. So we breed for docility and the products that we want, and we're changing these animals profoundly. So the, universe, the uh, Nas Australian National University put up this chart. It's the uh, reduction in brain size compared, comparing domestics to their wild counterparts. The best example I know is sheep. If you look at a wild sheep's brain compared to its domestic counterpart, the wild sheep's brain is 50% bigger. And it's not a generalized reduction. The thinking part of the brain, the neocortex, basically dis disappears. So there's one final thing in this. Because animals are valuable and we transport them, it turns out that you can't move an animal without moving everything that lives in it and on it. So when you put all of these factors together, you end up with this, a vicious circle. Increasing virulence of the pathogens, resistance of the host, and sometimes you can get a disease that will jump a species barrier and become contagious in that species. And a couple of examples to give you an indication of how profound this is. The University of Washington at Pullman took six healthy bighorn sheep, all healthy, and six domestic sheep, and they just put them together to see what would happen. The first bighorn was dead in four days. The last one was dead in 71 days. You don't have to repeat this experiment anymore. It's been done over and over again. UC Davis summarized the data. 100% of the wild sheep will die from diseases the domestics don't even know they have. So if that's sheep, this is what has come to us from animals, and domestication has played a profound role in most of these. So you get down to the bottom, and you're starting to look at some of the more recent ones, like SARS, which came as a coronavirus, went from Chinese horseshoe bats into uh, these palm civets in domestication, thousands of them in cages to people. 44 people died in Canada, 800 worldwide. We have a new version of this already. It's called MERS. It's from the Middle East. That's why the ME and the domestic animal in between, the Egyptian tomb bats and the people, are camels. So last, I want to give you the kind of icing on this rather nasty cake. It turns out now we're finding out that these same pathogens, the bacteria, the viruses, and so on, are not just causing acute diseases. They're probably responsible for a majority of our chronic diseases as well, including cancers. 1980, the medical textbook said that there were no human cancers caused by viruses. We're over 20% now, and it's continuing to rise. And it's not just viruses. This is Barry Marshall, who proved that ulcers were not just caused by uh, stress, they were caused by a bacterium. And they laughed at him, so he infected himself, cured himself. 2005, he won a Nobel Prize. Well, where does the Helicobacter pylori come from that causes that? It comes from domestic sheep. It turns out that this is the cause of almost all stomach cancers and most GI cancers, the number three killer. Now, before we leave the North American model, there's one final thing I want to Put in. This is C. Gordon Hewitt, Canada's Dominion zoologist that was participating in all that stuff that President uh, Roosevelt and Prime Minister Laurier uh, put together at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, his great work, The Conservation of the Wildlife of Canada, had to be published posthumously because in 1920, when he, he had been to a wildlife congress, he contracted influenza that took his healthy life in nine days. It was the end of the Spanish flu that killed somewhere between 50 and 100 million people. More, it killed more people in 25 weeks than AIDS has in 25 years. It came from chickens. But their incredible work with wildlife um, gave us all the wildlife that we have as a public trust. It's profoundly important. Unfortunately, nobody knows the story that I just told you, which is why I call it the greatest story never told. And by the 1980s, there were incredible efforts to reverse every single part of the North American model. They not only wanted to put the head, uh, price back on the head of wildlife, they wanted to take it further. They wanted to actually promote the markets, put these animals behind fences, call it game farming for domestic animals. Now, why in the world would you want to do that? The products that they identified were venison that's nowhere near economic. Velvet antler, 
urine, and shooters. Now, we need to look deeply into what each one of these things are and ask ourselves whether these are legitimate. This, these pictures were taken in Alberta. This is what velveting looks like. This is absolutely brutal. This is living, growing bone tissue that's highly enervated. It's so sensitive when they're growing like that, you can watch them shake flies off their racks. They do this every year. For what? For an aphrodisiac or something that doesn't work? It's, it's ridiculous. The next product is urine. They want hunters to take this product out into our most precious habitat, despite the fact that CWD and a whole bunch of other diseases can be transmitted in urine. Eh, it's irrelevant. The last is what these, they develop these mutant antlered animals and they put them in a fenced area where they can't get away and they're called shooters and they want to call this hunting. Now, I've hunted my entire life. This is something completely off the, the charts in terms of obscenity. It's ridiculous. So all of this was proposed on the basis of economics well, I happen to know a bit about economics, and when I questioned my government, asking them you know, for all of the demand schedules, measures of elasticity and diminishing utility, and they looked at me like I was speaking Greek because they had never done any analysis. They didn't even know what those things were. Well, my province, Alberta, refused any comprehensive analysis of this. That's their analysis on the left. There was one government in Wyoming that did a comprehensive analysis of at least the disease side of game farming. And it was because Wyoming is home to some of the finest scientists, wildlife scientists on the planet. They looked at this carefully and they said no possible way. These were some of the things that we found. Diseases, parasites, genetic pollution, habitat loss, destruction of our system of conservation, economic disaster, this is ridiculous. First Nations were vehemently opposed to this. Putting wildlife in cages represents an affront to their most sacred beliefs. Chief Beaver told me, he said, what the hell is this? He's, now they want to put animals on reservations. Well, my government didn't pay any attention. They rammed it through. This is what we got. This is not a natural environment. It took less than three years. We had this, a massive epidemic of bovine tuberculosis across North America on game farms. It went to cattle, went to bison, went to pigs, and 42 people had to begin treatment just in my province for bovine tuberculosis from elk farms. We had imported it from the United States with the elk, and we didn't even have this cleaned up before this happened in 1996. Two things, almost the same day. First, the British government had to admit that people were in fact dying of mad cow disease. And second, the Canadian government confirmed that we had CWD on a game farm in Saskatchewan. Now, these are sister diseases. So I want to talk really briefly. Dave Clausen is going to go into more detail. So, but I want to, I want to mention a few things about prion disease. These are so-called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. They're caused by protein only. So this isn't a bacterium, it's not a virus, it's not alive, strictly speaking, so you can't kill it. It's incredibly resilient. And unlike mad cow that did go to people, this one in deer is highly contagious. Now a lot of what I've talked about um, has to do with domestication and disease. Well, what about prion diseases? There is no evidence whatsoever a scrapie in wild sheep, that's our oldest known prion disease. Didn't exist before um, domestication and probably before Robert Bakewell started interbreeding, uh, breeding in and in on sheep. There's no evidence whatsoever of BSE in wild bovids. There's no evidence whatsoever of mink encephalopathy in wild mink or felids in, in cats. It does not exist and certainly no evidence that CWD was a long-standing disease of North American wildlife, didn't exist before uh, scrapie-infected sheep were in Colorado and deer were put in, in confinement in Fort Collins and Sibyl, Wyoming. This is uh, from the Canadian government's uh, CWD control strategy. This is what the disease looks like. This is a graph of what happens where this occurs. It grows, it spreads, it persists in the soil, it evolves. And now we're finding out, Chris Johnson and Claudio Soto have shown clear evidence that you can get prion contamination in and on plants, you can't wash it off. Well, what does that mean? Well, 
susceptible species, not just here, not just all of our elk, deer, moose, and caribou, but around the world there are species that are susceptible to this. These are a few. So when we look at this, we can't look just at the biology as fascinating and terrifying as that might be because the ultimate question is what happens if CWD happens to go to people and behaves in us like it does in deer where it's highly contagious. We don't know how to deal with that. That's a nightmare. But when we do comprehensive analysis, we have to ask what this means to our economy. Well, this is a map of what the UK looks like superimposed over North America. CWD is as far south as Texas. It's halfway up Alberta and Saskatchewan on its way to the Arctic. It's west of the Continental Divide, and it's as far east as New York. It is profoundly present in most of our major um, agricultural areas. So the issue is what happens if wildlife becomes perceived as a threat to agriculture, if it threatens our international markets? What we know from the past is that a threat to agriculture from wildlife typically requires the elimination of wildlife to protect the ag interest, even where they caused the problem in the first place. Now, to put this in a little perspective, I want to refer to Paul McCready's work where he looked at humans, livestock, and pets compared to wild vertebrates. 10,000 years ago, humans, livestock, and pets made up less than one-tenth of one percent of that biomass on land. Today, we're more than 97 percent. Wildlife is that last three percent. These guys are politicians raising their right hand to swear an oath to defend the public interest. There are major requirements that they have to take into account. On the left is the public interest and the precautionary principle. Where there is a threat of severe or irreversible harm, an absence of proof that it will happen or is happening cannot be used. If the threat is big enough, you cannot go ahead with the initiative. The second thing is accountability or polluter pay. You may have heard that BP just agreed to an 18, almost $19 billion settlement for the Deepwater Horizon. Well, we can debate whether or not that was enough, but the point is that polluter pay is vitally important. Well, when it comes to wildlife and disease like CWD, this is upside down. Diseased animals in Canada are worth more to a game farmer than healthy ones because our government pays them, when they have to destroy them, up to $8,000 a piece. We have people within the government that are absolutely horrified about all of this, but they can't speak out because we don't have adequate whistleblower protection. But whistleblower protection, when you think about it, is a lot like endangered species law. Almost by definition, it's too late. When you need a whistleblower, something bad has happened. So what I've been proposing is a code of professional conduct for legislators to require them to show their work, to work for the public, to use science and evidence-based decision making. What we have in Canada right now under the Harper government is the opposite. They're attacking science at every single level. I'm just embarrassed about this. We call it decision-based evidence making because that's what they're doing. They already made the damn decision, then they look for something to justify it. It's ridiculous. So finally, when we're looking at wildlife, this is what we get. We get the fittest. If we go for the short-term buck, this is what we get. This deer didn't even live long enough to become a captive target for a paid shoot. I guess we should call it captive amusement. Um, anyway, we're back to um, Bill Gates. Bill Gates is absolutely right that the greatest threats to this planet are currently coming from microbes. Unfortunately, he is entirely focused on response at faster testing, better developments of vaccines, and a military-like distribution. What about where the damn diseases are coming from? We're creating the diseases that are killing us, and it's completely perverse. It's upside down because of what I call big pharma. I spell it with an F. Agriculture, agri-food, pharmaceuticals, and chemicals, they're all interrelated. The biggest sales for pharmaceutical companies 
80% of their antibiotics don't go to people, it goes to ag. So they're creating ever more bacteria, that's okay, they just sell more. Most of the vaccines don't go to people, goes to agriculture. This is perverse, it's upside down. What I really like to do though, is that I would like to be able to have people see the real scientists talking about these issues in detail, so they'll know that it's not just one lunatic from Canada. So I'm trying to put all this into a film to point out that this isn't an accident, we're doing this on purpose. So whatever support you may, might be able to offer us um, would be greatly appreciated. I sincerely appreciate your attention and your invitation to come here today, and I applaud everything that you're doing. I just hope we can work together. Thank you very much. minutes for questions during the transition to the next speaker, so I'll be moving around here, but that's fine. Feel free. Any question? Yeah. So the bottom line is that um, 
The disease was spread throughout the continent. This is a new disease. This is not a long-standing North American wild disease. It was probably created in captivity. So what we need to be able to do is understand what role wolves might play in this. Unfortunately, they might have a significant role, but infected animals shed prions in urine, feces, and saliva for up to a year before they ever get sick. So the, what, what the wolves would do is take out here uh, as quickly as possible when they are sick, and they would eliminate the super sites because when a carcass decomposes, it stays, it persists in the soil, and there's something about glomerulonite in the protein soils that increases the infectivity by up to 700 times. So that's a problem. You refer to the pathogen for the thing is not living per se. It's just a protein. There's so no protein, protein. Yeah. So the protein. So I just is the question, what triggers the mechanism of oh, the Are you getting more of it? Well no. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to you know, get it. Yeah, I know. It's a replication of nucleic acids. There's no DNA, there's no RNA, so how the hell does this work? Yeah, what's the life force? Right. We don't exactly know, but it's template. A malignant one, this misfolded protein, can uh, somehow magically make a normal one take its shape. We don't really understand that. Anyway, I'm getting the book. Thanks again. <laughs>